Tonight, a manhunt underway after three festival goers are killed in a mass stabbing in Germany. Welcome to ABC News Queensland, I'm Ellen Fanning. A baby paralysed in Gaza's first case of type 2 polio in 25 years. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. withdraws from the presidential race, throwing his support behind Donald Trump. And taking a wagon ride back in time, retracing the historic Cobb & Co. mail run. Good evening. German police are hunting for a man who stabbed to death three people at a summer festival in the northwest city of Zollingen. Eight more festival goers are wounded, five of them seriously, in what police say was a deliberate attack. A lone male suspect is on the run and the motive for the attack remains unclear. A summer party in honour of a German city celebrated for its long history of blade making ending in violence. But we must now bitte das keine Panik ausbrechen. The organizer telling locals to go home calmly even though an armed suspect was still on the loose. The attack began just after 9:30 p.m. when a man started stabbing people seemingly at random. First responders raced towards the main square as a suspect disappeared into the darkness. Heavily armed police searching for him long into the night. For now, there's little sign of him, and police aren't sure of his motives either. We're assuming he's a lone wolf. He's on the run. Witnesses are in shock or can't speak right now. We have to pull all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. The attack is just the latest knife crime to shock Germany. In May, a failed Afghan asylum seeker allegedly stabbed to death a policeman and wounded several others in a politically motivated attack in Western Germany. With knife crime seemingly on the rise, the Interior Minister is now reportedly proposing to ban switchblades and knives longer than six centimetres. Brutal crimes are committed with knives and they cause serious injuries or even death. That's why we need stricter laws and more controls. The Minister will be hoping this latest shock stabbing helps convince doubters in the government to push the proposed changes through. Michelle Rimmer, ABC News. The World Health Organization says a baby has been left paralysed in Gaza's first case of type 2 polio in 25 years. The United Nations has repeated calls for a ceasefire so the polio vaccine rollout can go ahead safely. They say delaying a humanitarian pause will increase the already high risk of the disease spreading among the children of Gaza who are living in unsanitary conditions. Hamas has agreed to a seven-day pause as requested by the UN. The WHO says at least two rounds of the vaccine for every child under 10 will be needed to halt transmission. The federal government is under renewed pressure to take practical action to stop men's violence against women. Amid a horrifying year of gendered violence, an expert panel has called for sweeping reform, including better data, specialist crisis accommodation and tougher restrictions on alcohol and gambling. Across the country, communities were left outraged by the killing of so many women earlier this year. No more violence, no more hate. It prompted a crisis response from leaders in May who asked an expert panel to urgently advise on how to combat men's violence against women and children. Its recommendations now laid bare. The government commissioned it uh, and we feel they need to act upon it. Among them, that National Cabinet keep the issue as an ongoing priority. Also calls for an urgent inquiry into the link between suicide and victims of family and sexual violence. Prioritising the experience of marginalised groups, including First Nations people, and youth-specific services to help children affected by domestic violence who often end up at adult services. They can't access entitlements that might be available to an adult because they need a parent's consent. The panel also recommended a total ban on gambling ads, a move currently being pushed for by some in Canberra, and restricting when alcohol can be sold and delivered because it's known to increase the severity and frequency of violence. We know it has a direct link to homicide. 
So that's really, really important for us to face up to. As the Domestic Violence Commissioner made clear this week, there must also be a fresh focus on engaging men and boys at risk of using violence. And as both major parties work through the recommendations, that's one thing they already agree on. There is more work to be done and we've been very open about that. There is so much more to be done. Two months ago, the government began publishing the number of women killed in intimate partner violence. So far this year, that's 15. But one of the biggest challenges remains, which is knowing just how widespread domestic, family and sexual violence is. And collecting more of that data is considered crucial. Evelyn Manfield, ABC News, Canberra. And if this story has raised any issues for you, you can call the National Sexual Assault and Family Violence Counselling Helpline on 1800 RESPECT. Queensland's mining regulator has shut down operations at a Bowen Basin coal mine after two fatal incidents in three weeks. A worker was killed when a haul truck ran over a light vehicle on Thursday afternoon. Earlier this month, a 48-year-old worker died after being struck by a crane. The mine will remain closed until deemed safe by authorities. The Queensland Government has launched a series of ads raising awareness about coercive control. The campaign will roll out across social and legacy media and aims to educate Queenslanders on the warning signs of coercive control as well as what affirmative consent looks like in practice. It comes ahead of affirmative consent laws that will come into effect at the end of next month and the criminalisation of coercive control from May next year. The ads are targeted at both victims and perpetrators of domestic and family violence. Because if we do not change the behaviour of the person doing the harm, we will not break the cycle. It cannot just be about removing people from harm. It's got to be about breaking this cycle. It's election day in the Northern Territory and voters are deciding if Labor will get a third term in government. Both major party leaders are expecting a tight contest. Hoping to woo voters one last time on election morning, it was a little quiet for the major party leaders. The old days of going to a school, getting your sausage, I think you're sort of dwindling really. Oh, so people have turned down in big numbers to do early voting and so we would expect today to be a little bit slower than traditional. Around half of the Northern Territory's enrolled voters made their choice at the ballot box before Election Day. That's just over 74,000 people. Independent and Greens candidates have been more prominent at this election, campaigning on issues some voters say have been ignored. Just the uh, youth direction, just a bit more help for them. You know, I think they've been lost at the moment. Thought I'd just go for the uh, lean towards an independent and then see how that goes. Climate. Uh, fracking, those things that I find the two big major parties are doing pretty poorly on. A better economy, um, stronger for small business and um, the crime problem which has been ongoing forever. Here in the Northern Territory, local politics matters with just 6,000 people in each electorate. From the seats here in Darwin to Arnhem Land and the remote seats in the desert and Alice Springs. While there are more remote voters on the roll at this election, the Electoral Commission's predicting the remote turnout won't be much better than four years ago when COVID was at play. And most remote seats had a turnout rate hovering around 50%. Acknowledging that we're, we're still dealing with, with funerals, sorry business and so forth, so sometimes our access and the time that we can stay in communities has been restricted like it happens every event. Labor's vying for a third term in government and holds 14 of the Northern Territory Parliament's 25 seats. The country Liberal Party needs to jump from seven seats to 13 to form majority government. Voters will soon know if a predicted swing against Labor can deliver this. Felicity James, ABC News. It's been a century since Australia's Cobb & Co coaches ran their last mail run. Now hundreds have gathered in rural Queensland to recreate the historic run. An Australian icon brought back to life after a hundred years. It just gives me a lovely, fuzzy feeling. I think I'm fairly well dressed up for it, yes. I don't normally dress like this. Cobb & Co coaches used to transport mail and people through regional Australia. The last run was in 1924 between Surat and Yuba in Queensland's Maranoa region. Cobb & Co was a way of life. 
better way of life. This weekend, hundreds are taking part in a recreation of that final run. Historian Steve Ralph built the main coach. Cobb and Co was very important. They had mail, they had gold, they carried freight, uh, they were the lifeline. Cole Anderson has been training her horses for months, but with just weeks to go, she broke her tibia. There was no way in the world I was going to miss out on this ride. She's enlisted an army of family and friends to get her through. We're going to pull up at our stops and we've got all the food on board, so I don't even have to get out of the wagon to go eat. Um, it's just all there, cup of tea, cup of cake. I've got sandwiches wrapped, some um, sorted. The ride left Surat on Saturday morning. It's not expected into Yulba near Roma until Sunday afternoon. These days, if you were to drive that route, it would only take an hour. The Surat post office still does that mail run 100 years on. Today we do it in a um, D-Max ute which is far more comfortable than what it was in the old days with the coach. And just a bit quicker. Toby Loftus, ABC News, Surat. In Indonesia, the parents of children who were killed or injured after consuming toxic cough medicine say their compensation is pitifully small. More than 200 children died and over 100 were left with debilitating, lifelong injuries from cough syrup contaminated with a chemical usually found in antifreeze. Two years after launching a class action over the deaths and injuries of their children, parents and lawyers meet to assess the decision and it's another blow. No parent wants their child's life to be reduced to a figure, but the court's decision is far from just. It feels like humiliation. Memories follow me left and right. Hey, everyone. Safitri Puspa lost her eight-year-old son, Pangagar, after he was prescribed liquid paracetamol by a doctor. As hundreds of children became sick with acute kidney disease across Indonesia, a common link emerged. Syrup medicine made by the manufacturer Afi Pharma that had been approved for sale. While more than 200 babies and children died, others were left with severe disabilities, forcing some parents to quit work to look after their children full time. Four employees of the drug maker were jailed last year, but the company, the raw ingredient supplier and Indonesia's drug regulator have always denied responsibility and blamed each other. Now, a two-year-long class action has concluded with a court awarding families just over $5,500 each, well short of what they asked for. The judge ruled the syrup manufacturers did do something illegal, but instead of forcing them to pay real compensation, they just have to pay a token amount, more like a donation. At no point in the past few years has Indonesia's health ministry or drug regulator been found at fault over the deaths. Lawyers say the families are disappointed this latest civil court decision also let the government bodies off the hook. We've already been through our lowest point well before this court process, so we can still fight and look at avenues for appeal. The syrup medicine manufacturer has criticised the court decision and still maintains it wasn't obliged to test ingredients it bought from suppliers. Bill Bertles, ABC News, Jakarta. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. began his campaign for the White House as a Democrat. He then announced he would be running as an independent. Now, the nephew of the late Democratic President John F. Kennedy has suspended his own bid and endorsed Donald Trump. On the campaign trail in Arizona, with a special guest in tow. His candidacy has inspired millions and millions of Americans, raised critical issues that have been too long ignored in this country. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has thrown his support behind Donald Trump after suspending his own campaign for the White House, claiming he never got a fair go. In my heart, I no longer believe that I have a realistic path to electoral victory in the face of this relentless systematic censorship and media control. RFK Jr. says he's found he's aligned with the Republican candidate on key issues, including funding foreign wars and border security. And the Democrats ignored his approaches. Vice President Harris declined to meet or even to speak with me. 
RFK Jr.'s polling numbers were dropping and his funds dwindling ahead of his decision. He was also making headlines more for his bizarre encounters with animals than his campaign. I said, let's go put the bear in Central Park and we'll make it look like he got hit by a bike. <laughs> RFK Jr. comes from one of America's most prominent Democratic families. And under the authority... His uncle was President JFK. His father was also assassinated while seeking the Democratic presidential nomination. His siblings have condemned his decision to back the Republican candidate. Our brother Bobby's decision to endorse Trump today is a betrayal of the values that our father and our family hold most dear. These past weeks, it's been all about the Democrats, a new candidate, a new running mate, a star-studied convention. But with this announcement, the pendulum swings a little bit back towards the Republicans. And both parties will be eagerly awaiting the results of the first polls after this latest twist in the campaign. It's a little disappointing just because we put a lot of time and energy into this. The truth is more encouraged than it was before. As the presidential race heads into the home straight. Barbara Miller, ABC News, Washington. Madison de Rosario is Australia's highest profile Paralympian and will be the joint flag bearer at the opening ceremony in Paris this Thursday. She's going into her fifth Paralympic Games, seeking to add to her two gold medals and to continue her work as an advocate for disability. Madison de Rosario is leaving no stone unturned in her quest for more glory at her fifth Paralympic Games. Oh, that's nice. In a long and decorated career, she finally broke through to win a Paralympic gold medal in the 800 metres and the marathon at the Tokyo Games three years ago. Yeah, Madison de Rosario takes the gold in the marathon. But she's not resting on her laurels. Instead, she's pushing harder than ever. Once you kind of do it, you, you want to know how much further you can go than that. And so De Rosario has dropped the 800 metres from her program and is going all out for gold in the 1500 and 5000 metres events on the track. We weren't willing to line up for an event that we didn't think we could contend a gold medal in. Then De Rosario will defend her marathon gold in a field that's rapidly evolving as it becomes more professional. In wheelchair racing, it's becoming far more realistic to be able to be a full-time athlete. And the result of that is faster athletes, it's stronger athletes. Which in part helps explain why De Rosario has become one of Australia's biggest Paralympic stars. She's been a magazine cover girl and even had a Barbie doll manufactured in her likeness. It's given her a platform to talk about disability in a way that she once couldn't have imagined. But as her profile grew, so did her understanding that she had a voice. There was a chance that I could actually use that platform for something really, really good and I didn't want to be a representative of disability. I wanted to be an athlete, I wanted to be a woman, I wanted to be a person with a disability, I wanted to be everything else that I am and all of those things be accepted as a whole. Madison D. Rosario! When the Paralympics roll around, um, Australians get an opportunity to see um, a lot of disabled people doing the things they do. And they see people like you, who are exceptional, whereas most disabled people aren't elite athletes. How do you deal with that? If the only way we've decided disability is acceptable is if it's this high-performing, unattainable, goal, then we're not doing justice to the entire community. Which, according to the ABS, is about 20% of Australia's population. And I don't want people that look like me to watch the Paralympic Games and want to be a Paralympian. I, I want young kids with a disability and their families and their friends to watch the Paralympics and just see endless potential. And I, I don't think that needs to be sport. And when they turn on the television this Thursday, they'll see Madison de Rosario holding the Australian flag with swimmer Brendan Hall as the team marches down the Champs-Élysées. And they'll see endless potential. David Mark, ABC News. The Raiders have responded to last week's hammering by the Cowboys, upstaging the reigning premiers, the Panthers, 
22 to 18 in Canberra. A stunning intercept try made the difference and put the Panthers' position in the top two under pressure. A windy afternoon in the nation's capital and it was wreaking havoc on the players. It stretches out. But the Panthers quickly responded as the sides went blow for blow in the first half. This time. Leading 12-10 at the break, this try extended Penrith's buffer. Out of nowhere, Penrith. Before the hosts pegged back the margin with this full field intercept ensuring a major late season upset. We're going to make the finals. Across the ditch, the Bulldogs spoiled Sean Johnson's send-off in Auckland and officially booked their place in finals for the first time since 2016. The Bulldogs, they get away another cake. But they could finish the season without skipper Stephen Crichton. Jessica Stewart, ABC News. In the NRLW, the Knights have ended a two-game losing streak with a 36-16 win over the Eels. Newcastle star fullback Tamika Upton scored a double to give the defending champions their third win of the season. Kickoff was delayed by more than 40 minutes with the NRL set to review why medical staff weren't in place for the start of the game. Meanwhile, North Queensland overpowered the Raiders, winning by 10 points in Canberra. Hawthorne has cemented its final spot with a thumping win over North Melbourne in Launceston to continue the team's stunning rise under Sam Mitchell. On a weekend of lopsided results, Geelong thrashed a hapless West Coast, while last night Collingwood was far too good for Melbourne. Today, the Hawks sent a finals warning to their opponents with a record victory. A wet and miserable Launceston greeted Hawthorne and North Melbourne for their rescheduled clash, but the time change and the conditions didn't bother the Hawks. Hawthorne kicking eight second quarter goals to end the contest. They didn't relent in the second half, Hawthorne recording its biggest ever win over North Melbourne. And every other club fears what's ahead. In Geelong, the game at Cardinia Park resembled a training drill as the Cats did as they pleased against an insipid West Coast. Jeremy Cameron booting seven first half goals as Geelong became just the eighth team in history to lead by 100 points at the main break. Just all class. In his farewell game, Zach Tui kicked a rare goal. Cameron finished with nine as the Cats moved into third, but they'll be sweating on the fitness of Tom Stewart, who finished the game on the bench with hamstring tightness. Last night, Nick Dacos did no damage to his Brownlow medal hopes, amassing 40 disposals and kicking two goals as Collingwood thrashed Melbourne at the MCG. But there will be no premiership defence, relying on Carlton to lose to St Kilda by a fanciful margin to move into the eight. We'll sit and watch finals with a bit of a sick feeling in their guts because um, we want to be playing finals this time of year. It brings down the curtain on a disappointing Demons campaign as questions continue to swirl around the future of several stars. Christian will be a part of this footy club for the next five years. Um, he's had a really challenging time. Um, we all know that. Um, he's having to work through a lot of uh, emotions um, and suffer a lot of trauma. Um, but we'll be there to support him. Kazai Pickett will miss the first three games of next season, suspended for this bump on Collingwood captain Darcy Moore in the second term. Tom Wildey, ABC News. Richmond has claimed the AFL's wooden spoon for the first time in 17 years after losing to Gold Coast 94-66 at the MCG. With club greats Dustin Martin and Dylan Grimes watching on, Marlon Pickett gave Tigers fans something to cheer about, starting as the sub, but coming on to score in his final AFL game. But the Suns were too good as they controlled the game to the end to end their underwhelming season with a victory. Returning Olympians and injured veterans have joined thousands of competitors on the Gold Coast for the World Lifesaving Championships. The international event is set to continue for the next fortnight. From the podium in Paris to the world stage in his backyard. Riley Fitzsimmons is swapping the kayak for a surf ski in the hopes to back up his Olympic medal success at the World Surf Lifesaving Championships. It's probably been 20 years almost I've been in surf life saving. It's like riding, riding your favourite bike. So, um, yeah, once I get back in the surf ski, I'll feel right at home. 
He's just one of Australia's Olympians who will compete over the next 17 days. It is quite special to have it in our own backyard here on the Gold Coast. Um, you know, we train in these conditions all the time, so it's going to be very, very cool to, to showcase this to the rest of the world. With events in the sand, surf and pool, athletes are keen to prove themselves, including fledgling countries like Argentina, where just getting here is half the battle. We pay uh, every single penny of the trip. We pay the plane, we pay the stay, we pay everything. That's why, because for us it's very difficult, but this difficult is like empowering. This is the biggest competition for surf life saving worldwide, attracting around 5,000 competitors from more than 40 countries. It's the first time it's been held on the Gold Coast in 36 years, estimated to boost the local economy by $19 million. But it's not all about accolades. Invictus Australia, an organisation who supports veterans through sporting rehabilitation, has doubled the size of their team since their debut last championships. Our connection is pretty much giving people a voice and an opportunity just to, you know, share their experiences and, uh, you know, be involved, um, have a space that they can go to when they feel like there's nowhere else to go. Jessica Lamb. ABC News, Gold Coast. A rare baby southern white rhino has been born at Melbourne's Werribee Zoo. The male calf was born last weekend after a 16-month pregnancy. Staff say the baby and its mother have been forming a remarkable bond. The calf is the first to be raised naturally by a mother in Victoria in about 20 years. The southern white rhino was at one time close to extinction, but there are now about 10,000 in the wild thanks to conservation and breeding programs. Let's look at the weather now with Jackie McLaren and what a warm week ahead. Yes, we certainly are in for unusually warm weather for this time of the year. It's hard to believe we're still in winter. Good evening, Queensland. More on those temperatures a little bit later, but as for today, well, a sunny Saturday for most, but we did see some light isolated showers around the north tropical coast and it sure was warm. Above average temperatures right across the state. In the north, Palmerville hit 38 degrees. Meanwhile, further south, Birdsville Two hit its peak at 38. Brisbane hit a top of 26 and right now as the Lions are just moments away from kickoff it's 19 degrees. To photos now and Pax Rose with the sun in Wynnum and a warm 33 degrees did not stop Ian from getting out and enjoying the day at Charleville. On to the satellite and mostly cloud free for us but there is a low and a series of troughs bringing plenty of cloud to southern states at the moment. So an unsettled Sunday for southern capitals, quite different for northern parts though, 35 for Darwin. On to the chart and it's here where we can really see the story behind these warm temperatures. This high is keeping things mostly settled but it's this trough in the west which is key for us as it grabs all the heat out there and continues to drag it east bringing a warm end to our winter season. To forecasts now and in the north showers possible along the coast and we do have a strong wind warning for the Torres Strait and Peninsula waters. Sunny skies continuing inland after a foggy start and a windy and warm 38 degrees for you, Birdsville. The foggy morning continuing in the southeast with a perfect beach day on the way. 27 degrees for the Sunshine Coast. Brisbane heading for a warm winter's day at 29. 31 degrees for you, Ipswich, Redcliffe, 26. Surfers, small, clean conditions in the morning, but if you can hold out until Tuesday, we've got some peaky, fun-sized surf on the way. Boaties, those winds will pick up to 20 knots in the afternoon. Seas around one metre. Sunrise will be at 21 past six in the morning. And looking at our final week of weather, it's going to be warm. The capital reaching 32. Ipswich peaking at 34. But Ellen, good news for those heading to River Fire on Saturday. Sunny, fine and a top of 34. And that's winter. And that is the news and weather to this moment. Thank you so much for your company. Stay up to date on the website. But for now, good night.